This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, as we continue to read Luke 19. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Brooke. It's a beautiful reminder for us that's coming up soon when we prepare for this Lenten season as we get ready for uh, Christ who's coming to uh, be praised on Palm Sunday not this Sunday, that story bookends uh, another story as well from Luke. So I think this is a beautiful reminder about where Jesus is going, and we know how that story is going to turn out. The disciples and his followers, they didn't know ultimately how this story was going to take place. Remember on this day that Jesus comes into Jerusalem triumphantly, where they sing Hosanna the highest to him, his disciples are walking like they are also military heroes, that they have gone to war and the battle is yet to only begin where they will overthrow the Roman Empire. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Jesus didn't come to be a military leader to lead them to overthrow, which leads us to another part of our scripture this morning, again from Luke. This is Luke chapter 18. Here are these words from the gospel of Luke 18 through 30. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Well, then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, it is impossible with man, it's possible with God. And Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has ever left home or his wife or brother or sister or parents or child for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come in eternal life. May God bless the listeners and readers of his word this morning. 
As we've been working through the Gospel of Luke, I hope it's been a blessing to you. I think there's a great sense of continuity when you read from one story to another and understand some of the context. Unfortunately, we clergy have done you a disservice for many years and decades for some of us as we pop from story to story to story to Scripture to Scripture, where we fail to draw the line, the connection through all these pieces. And so you have a, a thread that runs through it, a, a continuity and understanding. Instead, we jump from piece to piece and hope that you make the patchwork quilt on your own, which is why I thought it'd be helpful for us to just slay the book of Luke and understand what's going on in it. So this morning, we dive deeper into an encounter that shakes us to our core, or should shake us to our core, because what's going to happen in the future. Just a few, uh, few short chapters later, Jesus' ministry is going to change from the Sea of Galilee, which is where he did most of his ministry, to Jerusalem area, which is what Brooke read for us this morning. And so we, we hear about a man who we should probably look up to spiritually. He was probably a giant at the time spiritually, who was invited to walk away, to walk away from his riches to walk toward the kingdom, but instead he walked away from his spiritual opportunity and the kingdom of God because it required more than what he wanted to embrace, which is a fear for many of us at points of times in our faith. It's a message that calls us to discipleship that embraces Christ above everything else. I'm just going to repeat it because I'm, I'm wrestling with it myself too. It's a message that calls us to discipleship that embraces Christ above all else. Well, that sounds like a great Sunday school answer for us. We should probably remember that. Maybe write it down and, and meditate upon that, about what God is truly calling us to do. Because there's times where we as the church, we put an emphasis on something that's really missing the emphasis that Christ is asking us to have part of. To embrace Christ above all else. That, that is answering the question of why do we do this Christian thing? Why do I allow myself to be a part of this faith basis? Why do, I, why do I want to be a part of this community? Because I want to learn how to embrace Christ above all else. And we're reminded that Jesus is offering a relationship, not commanding that we follow the 316 laws of the Old Testament. I just want to repeat that. Jesus did come to tell us to follow the 613 laws of the Old Testament. They were good laws. They do help us be holy. But following the 613 laws of the Old Testament is not enough to qualify us for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to offer us this intimate, passionate relationship through himself, Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. Verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answers. And he says, no one's good except God alone. And you must know the commandment. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your mommies and your daddies. And all these things I have said since I was a boy, he said. Well, that's an interesting story. Do you think you could follow all 613 laws of the Old Testament from adolescence to now? Without error. Without error. Because that's what this man was pretty high upon himself. And other people thought highly of him himself, that he was somebody without sin. And he believed that he had already received the kingdom of God. Which is why he's asking this unusual question of Jesus. What must I do to inherit? What must I do to receive eternal life? Because he already believes that he's got it in the bag. He's got it figured out. And he may have been popular, and he may have been received as a holy man as well. But we soon learned that he was apparently successful in all those things of the world. But in addition to these things, the man was also, uh, he tried to live a life without that relationship with God. See, he thought the relationship was based on following the law. Now, the law will help us become holy. But it will not determine a relationship with God. You can follow the rules and still not have a relationship with God. You could still follow the rules of our land, government-wise, and still not want to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, right? You could still follow the law and not claim to be an American. But you could be here in America. But this man hungered for more, and he understood that probably following the 613 laws of the Old Testament. Remember, we have the Ten Commandments, but there's an additional laws 
that take place in the first five books of the Old Testament. And we call that the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. And so this man, when he asked, what must I do to inherit it? He came to Jesus because he recognized that he alone could probably answer this question. And he was still wrestling with the why he was doing what he did. He knew the what and the how, but he didn't quite understand the why am I doing this and what would it lead to? See how it bounces back and forth to those questions. And so when the man calls Jesus good teacher, we don't know whether this man was trying to flatter Jesus or whether he saw something in Jesus, something unique, sent from God. We don't know for certain, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's not think terribly of him. Let's say that he did believe that maybe he was the son of God. Can you imagine the audacity of sitting down with God and asking him the question, what must I do to inherit? Because inheritance is usually predicated on somebody passing away, right? I'm going to take these goods now that somebody has passed away, that you are dead to me, and now I can receive these riches. That's not what's happening here. Jesus does not deny that he is indeed the good teacher, but he has wanted the man to see that only the only true one, the only true God. He's not ready to reveal that he is God himself as well. But Jesus answers the man's question on how to receive eternal life by first pointing him to the Ten Commandments, which seems like a pretty basic place to start, which is why we see the Ten Commandments posted around us still. And maybe sometimes you'll see it and post it in an elementary or high school hallway from time to time, uh, not in the Beltway of Columbus, mind you. But maybe out here, out here uh, we're, we still are appreciative about uh, having God in our schools. And I believe that this man was sincere in believing that he had kept probably all 613 commandments, but that's not enough. It'll never be enough. He was trying to live a good life, but unfortunately, like most people, he didn't understand that the Ten Commandments are more than the just following laws, but it's about the condition of the heart. And they're about not just external behaviors, but how we feel about God in that relationship. Jesus points out in the Sermon of the Mount, which we took a look at this summer, that the commands about killing are also addressed in the issues of hatred. And then the commands about forbidding, uh, forbidding adultery also address lust. And the stealing and lying can be part of gossip and misrepresentation. That sometimes what we feel is I'm following a commandment may slip into what we think is a secondary sin. But nonetheless, it's a sin. Anything that divides us from God is going to be a sin, which that includes hatred, that includes lust, that includes gossip and misrepresentation or coveting. Instead, he zeroes out the main obstacle for himself. That's what this man believes, that he has zeroed out the sin because he has followed what he thinks is the letter of the law. So verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Today, we, we sometimes don't always consider ourselves wealthy, but by global standards, we are wealthy. And if we consider our status now, 2,000 years after Scripture, if we took any character from the Old Testament, or the New Testament for that matter, if we took them today to 2023 and took them to our home, they would immediately see us as a lord or as a king. They've never seen such opulence of four walls that are straight and smooth and might have paint on it, carpet wall to wall, these opaque rugs that we might have, and the ability to change the temperature of our house or running water inside the house that would have blown minds galore, or to know that I could move it from hot to cold by just switching to here to here. It happens just because, well, I don't even know how it happens necessarily. I didn't have to be a master of my uh, HVAC program or my heating and cooling of my house to know how it works. It just does. It would have blown their minds to see the opulence that we live in. And so when Jesus gives his first command, you shall have no other God before me, he reminds us that there are no other words or no other nothing that we have. Nothing is more important or extends to a greater influence in our life than the Lord. But sometimes we have things that do distract us. Now, some of these things we've taken for granted because we've just received it for so long. But when we put it in perspective of a worldview, we truly are a blessed people. And tell the truth, 
I don't really want to give up my heating and cooling system. Do you? I was talking with my daughter about one of my very first cars I had, and many of you could probably share the first car you had didn't have air conditioning in it, right? Maybe you had 455. You rolled down all four windows and drove 55 miles an hour, and that was the only cooling you had. My daughter's like, how did you survive? I don't know how I made it this far. Many of you probably say, I don't know how I made it this far either then. But we take for granted some of the comforts that we have, and we truly are a blessed people. In this man's case, money was his God, not air conditioning. It was his source of security. The man really wanted to obey the commands. All he had to do was start by letting go of his riches, however. And I I think that's the case for many of us because we have the means frequently to solve our everyday problems by either using some of the wealth that we have or credit that we may have to fix some of the problems. And so I don't have to rely on going to God first in prayer. I'm able to fix a lot of these problems just on my own using Visa. Everywhere you want to go, right? Jesus is saying that we don't have to give away all of our riches, though. In this man's example, his riches were his God. And I'm not insinuating that is your story today. But this was a man who was divorced of having a relationship with God. And I I think that's the principle of what Luke is trying to help us understand, that we're called not necessarily to be so rigid on these 613 laws of the Old Testament, which that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so focused on. And here's Jesus saying, you're not quite getting the mark. You're going to have to do this through me. I'm inviting you to be in this relationship. So Jesus is saying, we don't have to give it all away, but we might need to give something away to be able to be in relationship with him, to remove something that's in that relationship. And again, about this message, the Bible records riches of Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Job, David, Solomon, on and on. These are people who had riches, and so riches are not wrong in themselves. But if they distract us from a relationship, then anything that distracts us from that relationship would need to be removed. But when riches come to our security and become our first love and our driving ambition, it's an idol. It takes place of God. And that's where the material problem is for this young man. I think Jesus may have been making several points to this man. And first, it's impossible to earn God's favor. This man wanted to know what he could do what he wanted to do to get God's favor. And because of our sinful nature, we are unable to do what is necessary for salvation. No matter what I do, it will not be enough without God. This man needed to come to Jesus, like the tax collector we read in an earlier chapter as well. He needed to come to Jesus and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So, a reminder for us is our only hope of salvation is God's mercy and his grace. We will never be able to work hard enough to earn God's grace. I'm going to repeat it, and then I'm going to post it on Facebook later on, because this is what I'm reminding myself about this week. Our only hope of salvation is God's mercy and his grace. We will never be able to work hard enough to earn God's grace. Our American ethos is work hard, and you will probably be rewarded. That's that's an important value that we have within our country, and we believe that it's Judeo-Christian oriented as well. God does bless people who work hard. And we have probably worked hard for some of the riches and wealth that we have, that we appreciate. But we should still work to eliminate idols from our lives, and we should still seek to live by the Ten Commandments. Those are good values for us to still continue to have. However, we do not have to do so because we think we can earn heaven by just following the Ten Commandments or the 613 laws of the Old Testament. We should do so because we love God. And this rich man, he was just hung up on the rules, not on the relationship. Saving faith involves loving the Lord above all else. And though we are imperfect in our obedience, we should be pursuing a perfect standard. Secondly, uh, truly obeying God's commands involves positive action. The man believes that he had shown regard for other people because he didn't do anything bad to them. Well, that's such a nice thought, isn't it? I thought, good thoughts for those people who were struggling, but I did nothing to help them. That's good enough, right? Check. Right, God? 
God wants him to understand that he also needs to take positive action. That this relationship changes our heart to such a degree that I, I want to be faithful. I want to be caring. I want to love others as I love myself. And if I don't love myself, I want God to continue to work on my heart so I might be able to love others as much as God loves his people. And they had been taught that, that distancing yourself from sin would provide for you this, this protection. That if I, if I take the sinful people and put them over there and I just work on myself, well, that's how I'm going to get to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus spends his entire adult ministry deconstructing that view. He never once says, hey, follow 613 laws of the Old Testament. He talks about love. He talks about forgiveness. He talks about sin and repenting. So there's something to be said about being holy and following some of those laws to help us be in that righteous relationship with God. But to be bold in faith, to go where sinners are, not so that my life would be changed, but so that I could share the one who had changed my life. That if I have invited Christ to be this light in my heart, that I might share this light with others, their lives might be changed. James chapter 2, verse 10 reminds us that for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. And so that's what this young man's finding out. He's following all 613 laws of the Old Testament, but Jesus is saying, are you really? Because if you've got one hole, you've got one mess up, you're not going to heaven. Not without me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So to truly live with God's heart means to do positive of good toward others as well. Not just having good thoughts for them into the distance or the future. I hope they do okay. I, I hope they're fine. But God has called me to be in a relationship with them as well. Not so that their, son, their sin would rub off on me and I might sin, but I might be able to share the one with them that transforms lives as my life has been transformed. So he chastises us for merely praying for a person and doing nothing practical to meet their needs. We're we'll reminded very curtly by Jesus, what we're called to do. And so we're the richest nation in the world. We're aware of that is right as well. And we, are, we have the most self-indulgent nation in the world as well, which you know, we're, we're thankful for all the things that we have. But I must confess that in this list of necessity, and this might be obscenely long, but maybe this list would include for you all the things that we take for granted. Again, like maybe an HD TV or a flat screen TV. There became a point in the last 20 years where you had a perfectly good 21 inch or 32 inch tube TV in your living room, and you said, hey, let's get one of those flat screen TVs. And maybe something in the back of your head said, let's not do it until it blows. Some of you waited. Some of you, like me, said, nah, we'll put that one in the basement. We'll get that big one, right? And now they're so super cheap, and we take it for granted what we have. And hey, I'm thankful that God has blessed me with a TV that I can watch from two rooms away. But is it necessary? No, but I like it. I'm thankful for it. But one of these things, if it was lost or broken, would I immediately replace it or would I ask, what is God calling me to do? Again, God has blessed us with many things and I'm thankful for that, but is that the impetus of my relationship with God? As long as I'm blessed, I will follow you. But what if, what if the worldly blessings start to diminish or we go into a slump as an economy? Is my relationship with God based on the blessings that I received? I must confess that that sometimes is a striking reality in our lives. It happens about every decade or so, right? And I don't think Jesus would say much about these things being bad to us, but are they hindrance to our relationship? Are they barriers to us reaching out to other people or to asking God to do something new and transformative of our life? Would we be willing to give up the stuff we have if God asked us to do it? Well, we just prayed here with the kids and we asked, how is God speaking to us? Unless God is audibly telling you to sell, fill in the blank, you probably can rest in comfort a little bit longer, right? But to walk with Christ, we need to sometimes get away from some of the things that hinder us in that relationship. Sometimes we choose to feel good over being faithful. We choose satisfying desires over pursuing holiness. And when there's a conflict between what we want and what God commands Frequently, our wants win out. And so the status, if it we're happy to follow the Lord, as long as it enhances our status and doesn't get in the way of our goals. 
Because I think God has put these goals on my heart and I need to establish them because God wants to bless me. Wait a minute, this is circular thought. This is not what Jesus intended. It's by that reckoning that we're doing what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. It's a difficult problem. And so when the man heard what Jesus said and what we were told, he became sad because he was very wealthy and he wasn't willing to let go of the safety that he had. Verse 24. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? Mind you, it's not impossible. But indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not condemning wealth. There were people in early church who were wealthy that helped Jesus be a part of his ministry. And they used their wealth to help Jesus be able to bless others, to support new ministries. And many of you in this room have done that for decades, being part of this church, helping us pay down our debt so we can continue to connect with our community and invite our community to be a part of our church, to experience new and powerful things by, I don't know, basketball, children's programming, all these things that our community wants that we have to offer. So the problem with wealth, and understanding that all of us have wealth by some measure, is that it tends to make us feel self-sufficient. We begin to trust our resources, our 401ks, our IRAs, our investments, our salaries, our stuff, more than we trust the Lord. And we feel that we can make it on our own. That's what the young rich ruler is. He thinks he can do it on his own. And Jesus is saying, "Uh uh-uh, nope, nope, nope. Not just you, by the way. Everyone will need to receive me. And the material of the world is very seductive. It absolutely is. And the pursuit of wealth can make us define our value of profitability rather than whether something is right and pleasing to God. The point Jesus is making is this. Investing in the Lord is a sure-fired investment. God will always see and multiply that which we truly invest in his kingdom. So if we want a surefire investment, we should double down with Jesus or triple down or just really make that our all in all. So let's try to be practical. What is it and what should we take away from all this text we've read this morning, from what Brooke read and to what I've also reinforced? So I want to suggest a few things for us. Number one, we must recognize the nature of the true gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And think about how we might have been tempted to answer this man when he asked the question, what can I do to receive life? We might have given him some theological bullet points and a prayer and considered it a deal done, but that's not the case. That wasn't the way Jesus had it. He called people to do more than express their faith. He called us to live by faith by following him. He made sure they understood the nature of commitment to following him. And his disciples understood that too. We've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, good job, let's continue. You've not yet reached. And so we should certainly explain the gospel as simply as we possibly can when we're talking with other people. And I I encourage you to pray with another person. I encourage you to have these conversations with people. However, we must be sure that we are bringing people to a point of discipleship, but also bringing people to involve and leading them to a commitment It also teaches them how to walk with Christ. And that's where a lot of us feel like, I ain't got that figured out yet. I don't have a a bullet point. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation to help people understand how to do this. But you have a story that you and Jesus have been writing together about how he has brought you to faith and how your life has been transformed and how you continue to give your life back to Christ and you continue to be blessed in return so you can be a blessing to others. We are turning to him because he hopes, we will, hopes that he will reach us in our goals or as we seek to accomplish his goals. Not necessarily mine. Are we willing to buck the pressure of society and go the way of Christ to follow him? Are we willing to adjust our own lifestyle so we can help others? Or are we willing to adjust our calendar to his priorities stated in the Bible? Or, or will we continue to adjust our requirements of faith to suit our convenience and our own desires? I must confess, there are times where I am selfish. And so, I have to follow a plan. I ask God to show me the way. Each morning, I invite God to be a part of my daily walk. And as I walk through the day, I take moment to pray to God, to speak to God. Sometimes it's long and lengthy. Sometimes it's very short. Sometimes it's, Lord, less of me, more of you. 
like the young rich ruler, it may be hard to hear the truth, but I am inviting God to be in that journey with me. So let's listen carefully. If you listen to God, he will communicate, and rather than get discouraged, let's ask God to help us trust him more fully. If you've not experienced the Holy Spirit, or you don't feel like you've hit a an experience with the Holy Spirit that actually register, or you could say, on this date in the calendar, or I really had this, maybe there's a little more trust in that relationship that you have to build as well. Instead of justifying our behavior, which we all do, let's face it, to work toward a real change. Some of us don't like change. Some, some people subscribe to the idea, nobody likes change except for a wet baby. Make progress. I find that sometimes I'm paralyzed by all the things that need to be done to correct my life that I don't even know where to start. Last week, my 10-year-old made a mess in her bedroom. She dropped a a cup of water all over the floor, which that's not the world's worst thing. It wasn't Kool-Aid. It was water. And she was absolutely petrified of what to do. And I, of course, gave her directions in my loud voice. (laughs) And she found herself paralyzed. And I said, go get a towel. And she stood there and she said, from where? Where do you think we keep the towels? I don't know. And I was reminded that she was not able to make a good decision. I did help her. I did help calm her as well. And I took a beat of my own and realized that sometimes we have to be patient with ourselves as God is patient with us as well. But progress can be made. It's not because I'm just a horrible, terrible person who's sinful. That's true. But I am redeemed. I want to be faithful. I want to have hope. I want to put my trust and faith in God. And that's what makes me worthy, is the light in my life. Because otherwise, I'm just a worm. I need to feel like mountains are being moved. I know I can't do it with a shovel. I can only do it with God. And we can get discouraged by the size of the tasks that we have to start moving this mountain one shovel full at a time. But when we do it with God, amazing things can happen. And we make progress. And we feel filled with the hope, with the joy, with the faith. It may be an hour or two a week that we have to put toward in that relationship. And maybe we learn how to do that throughout the day. Or maybe giving a little more financially to some ministry or some need. Or maybe it's perhaps you have to make a phone call to address a festering problem that you have with a a family or a friend or a co-worker that you have to let go of a a past hurt. I I don't know what it is that God's speaking to you. Maybe you need to make worship a higher priority of life. Or maybe you need to make time for God in your day. Or maybe perhaps you need to change the things that you do for fun. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today about. But if we are to turn to him because we hope that he will help us reach our new goals, or are we reaching out to accomplish his goals? There's some questions to be asked. And I'll tell you this, I don't know maybe what you were taught when you were younger, but I know some of you were taught not to ask so many questions of faith, that we're just supposed to trust. But the questions are healthy. And Jesus, being the Messiah, taught his disciples to ask those difficult questions. And they wrestled with it, just as we wrestle with it today. I invite you to ask God to help you with wrestling those questions that you might seek his goals first, so you might continue to be part of the kingdom of heaven. I know that you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't, I'd love to have a conversation with you later about it. But we've not yet arrived. When we talk about John Wesley's three stages of grace, we talk about this prevenient grace, this grace that goes before that was offered to all of us because we were just young. We couldn't make the decision. But at some point, you made a decision. You justified your faith and asked God to be a part of your heart. Now we seek sanctifying grace, the grace that continues to go before us that we might make the decision daily to follow him. My hope and prayer is that we all would seek that sanctifying grace, that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, you, and all those out there who have yet to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you again that we could be reminded through Scripture, that we could have conversation as a church, that we might be reminded to trust in you, to turn to you. And so, Lord, this morning, we ask you to do a new thing. 
we ask you to call upon, we, well, we call upon you, the Holy Spirit, to flood us, to direct us, to guide us, to change us, to just to make us better people. Not just for the sake of being better, but because we want to have a more perfect relationship with you, God. We know that it takes time and energy, and we know that you've already been doing that. And so we invite you to do a new and powerful thing in and through us. It's your name we pray. Amen.